This is the Economic Engine Performance Report, a registered event of Port Everglades Association. I'm Lori Baer. How great it is to greet our longtime participants as well as our first time guests. Welcome one and all. One of the biggest reasons for the enduring success of Economic Engine Performance Report is the ardent and generous support of our sponsor companies, each of them economic engines in their own right. I'm honored to recognize our premium sponsors. City of Hollywood and Hollywood CRA. Dania Point. Great Lakes Dredge and Dock. Orion Marine Construction, Shell Air, WSP, and our sincere thanks as well to our major sponsors shown here. You can certainly see from our table host sponsors shown here that the Economic Engine Performance Report covers the full spectrum of business here in Broward County. I'm especially pleased to announce that all of our sponsors automatically transfer over to next April when we resume our usual in-person format with networking reception and luncheon program. And now, we welcome to the podium our event chairman, Mr. David Candib, Vice President, Carnival Corporation. It is indeed an honor in my role as event chairman to welcome you to the 12th Annual Economic Engine Performance Report Forum presented by Port Everglades Association. When PEA conceived the idea of the Economic Engine Performance Report more than a decade ago, we realized the importance of filling hundreds of Broward County leaders in on how three critical engines, the seaport, the airport, and tourism, are driving our county's local economy and well-being. While none of us could have possibly predicted the recent circumstances that have befallen not just our county, but virtually the entire world, we recognize that now more than ever, it is vital for all of us to be aware of what's going on at the port, the airport, and on the tourism front. This year, further acknowledging Broward County's recognition of transportation as a vital economic driver, we have added to our panel of presenters, Ms. Gretchen Cassini, administrator of proceeds from our county's newly approved penny surtax. These funds, with capabilities for federal matches, will help advance major transportation projects and thereby stimulate the local economy and help mitigate impacts of COVID-19. These are, of course, unprecedented times. And one of the most obvious signs of our adapting to new strategies is the fact that this, perhaps the most important ever of our economic engine performance report events, is coming to you online as opposed to in person. While almost all of us have been impacted in one way or the other by the pandemic, it certainly has had a very profound impact on the tourism and hospitality industry, which in normal times supports the jobs of more than one and a half million Floridians. As Vice President of Development and Operations for Carnival Corporation, I can assuredly say that these have been challenging times, not only for us at Carnival Corporation, but moreover for all of cruise and travel interests throughout the world. Carnival Corporation is one of the world's largest leisure travel companies, encompassing a portfolio of nine global brands. Prior to COVID-19, our company, which is headquartered here in South Florida, has successfully homeported from Port Everglades dating back to 1934, with many of our brands and ships calling on the port, while our guests and crew utilize the surrounding airport and hotel infrastructure. We are preparing to resume operations in the United States when allowed, and our industry is committed to ensuring we do so in a manner that ensures the safety and security of not only our guests and crew, but all of those 
individuals who support the industry in the home ports, such as Port Everglades here, and in all of the destinations that we will visit. We look forward to being able to once again offer an unparalleled vacation experience while directly and indirectly creating employment for thousands of South Floridians. As with any long-term effort to restore vitality, we will need to continue to embrace the spirit of collaboration. And today's event is yet another step forward in the cooperative direction that will bring about a promising future. Broward County is very blessed with numerous leaders who are dedicated to doing everything they can to ensure a bright future. And to that end, I'm privileged to introduce the Honorable Mayor of Broward County, Mr. Dale Holness. My name is Dale Holness, I'm Broward County's Mayor, and thank you, David. And an abundance of thanks to all who are viewing this tape production of this year's Economic Engine Performance Report event. My work this year as a public servant has been unlike anything I'd ever faced before. When my fellow county commissioners selected me last November to be our county's mayor, my mission is to make Broward County a better place for all who live here by empowering our communities, strengthening our households and businesses, creating policies that afford access to opportunities and by unifying everyone across racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic backgrounds. I stated two of my priorities, and that was to help meet the needs of those who are struggling financially and to ensure broad access for healthcare, including mental health care. These priorities remain all as vital today as then, in fact, arguably more so. The past several months have required me and my colleagues to find balanced solutions related to the enduring dual priorities of economic well-being and public health. We are tasked with keeping our community as healthy and safe as possible while also maintaining the vigor of our economy, including the strength of our economic engines that are the focus of today's discussion. Last month, when we began seeing an uptick in COVID-19 cases, I was joined by dozens of other mayors from jurisdictions throughout Broad County in reiterating compliance with the mandate for wearing a mask. And we underscore that it is imperative for businesses to operate in compliance with the county orders under necessary threat of shutdowns and fines for those who do not cooperate. By and large, our county's businesses and our county citizens are cooperating in doing whatever it takes in promoting health and safety and ultimately working toward economic recovery. I urge all of you to continue to wear appropriate facial coverings and adhere to social distancing requirements because this truly has to be a team effort. My hat's off to Port Everglades Association for its active collaboration in making this 2020 edition of its Economic Engine Performance Report event a reality, and I'm pleased to be part of this on behalf of all of Broward County Commissioners and the 1,960,000 residents of Broward County. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Holness, for all you and the appointed officials throughout Broward County doing to lead us through these difficult times. My name is Richard Vogel. I am the president of the Port Everglades Association. Our association is proud to be holding this event again. This is our 12th year, and it is probably never more important than now. We look forward to hearing in a few minutes from the respective leadership of the seaport, the airport, and the tourism industry, as well from Gretchen Cassini, who is charged with administrating funds from Broward County's Penny for Transportation Surtax a levy that was proudly supported by Port Everglades Association. For more than 40 years, the Port Everglades Association has served as a critical bridge between public and private interests in support of initiatives surrounding Broward County Seaport. In these most challenging times, PEA's role has become all the more indispensable, facilitating productive exchanges as everyone grapples with the pandemic impacts, seeking to emerge even stronger than before. 
PEA's membership embraces virtually all segments of business related to Port Everglades, from cargo and cruise lines to terminal operators and petroleum companies, from logistics and warehousing to utility and rail providers. Also from engineering and environmental firms and all the way to bankers and lawyers. In short, the PEA encompasses the full spectrum of those with interest in the growth and success of trade, transportation, and tourism of Broward County. Personally, I've been in the port since 1992 as part of the petroleum industry, and we look forward moving together to make this county stronger following this pandemic. Now, we are honored to welcome to the program the Deputy County Administrator of Broward County, Ms. Monica Sapiro. Let me add my personal welcome to everyone taking part in the 2020 Economic Engine Performance Report event. So many of you who've been joining us for this event for many years are aware of Broward County government's uniquely tying the seaport, the airport, and convention and visitors bureau together. What you may not realize is the extent to which synergy drives growth. This collaboration is our richest asset between the key economic engines. It all starts with open lines of communication, in the, both in the day-to-day -day operations and the long-term strategic planning efforts. So that is critical to ensuring that projects are orchestrated and they move ahead in coordination without missing a beat, while also providing the flexibility to react to unanticipated challenges that may arise, as we see today. With the airport and seaport departments, as well as the Convention and Visitors Bureau, all under the umbrella of Broward County government, it's easy for everyone to get on and stay on the same page. Collaboration can accelerate funding, permitting, and other fast-track measures. And clearly, such collaboration has never been more essential or critical than it is today, as we look to restore our economy and over time emerge even stronger. Would our esteemed moderator and panel members please come forward and take their seats on the set. Our moderator is Mr. Heiko Dobrikow, General Manager of the Riverside Hotel. Our panelists include the executive leadership of our three economic engines. Mr. Mark Gale, Broward County Aviation Department. Ms. Stacy Ritter, Greater Fort Lauderdale Convention and Visitors Bureau. Mr. Jonathan Daniels, Port Everglades. Ms. Gretchen Cassini, Administrator of Proceeds from the Penny Surtax. Heiko, the program is yours. A wonderful good day. Uh, nice to have you here today at our 2020 Economic Engine Performance Report. We have an extremely esteemed panel here today. Next to me is Mark Gale. Our airport director, congratulations on your recent Apogee Award uh, that you received. Well earned, uh, Mark. Nice to have you. Stacy Ritter, nice to have you. Our CVB president, who uh, just recently got a nice designation. She is now a certified destination marketing executive. So congrat congratulations on that. And then we have a newcomer to us. We, we're really twisting it up, this one. Uh, Gretchen Cassini is here with the MAP, uh, is the MAP uh, uh, administrator with Broward County. It's nice to have you and giving us really some insights on our mo mobility plans. And the newest kid on the block, Jonathan Daniels, our port director. And I have to tell you, I met with Bertha Henry and Bertha asked me actually, who should we pick or what should we be looking for? And I, I told Bertha, I said, Bertha, it's quite simple. I would like to see somebody with the same hairstyle as mine I would like to see somebody with a beard like mine and somebody looks kind of distinguished, but that person needs to be much smarter than me. So welcome. I think they did a really good pick. Uh, and if audience, if you see that the similarities here are just breathtaking. So uh, the first thing that I want to tell the audience, I, I really want to take a moment 
and thank uh, Glenn Wilshire, our interim port director that really held it together uh, for quite some time uh, while we were in search of a new port director. So Glenn, if you're watching right now, we all want to just say thank you and how grateful we are. I also want to take a moment to thank Lori Baer. Laura Baer is our president and executive director of the Port Everglades Association. And she's such an instrumental community leader for us and a joy to work with. Sadly, I also want to remember an instrumental community leader. Marion Grace um, has just recently passed. She was with Broward Navy Days. She was in our community for a long time. She not only was a proud patriot of our armed forces, but I'm going to tell you what she did for our community was just second to none. Uh, she leaves a big gap, but she certainly left behind a huge legacy. So Marianne, may you rest in peace. Thank you for everything that you have done. So panelist, why don't we get right to it? About three months ago, we were supposed to have this panel. I was tickled pink to talk to all of you because we were poised for the best year ever. Seriously, for the best year ever. And then came, came COVID-19. And just briefly tell me, what did you have to go through in order to adapt to this new normal or this, this, the, the new protocols that we had? What, what did you actually have to do in order to just get through the last several months? Mark, why don't I start with you? Well, good morning, good afternoon, whenever we're going to play here. Heiko, thanks for the uh, the kind words. I'm sorry to let you and Jonathan down with the beard uh, issue. I, I've saved a lot of money in razors over the over my lifetime, uh, but I trust them in really, really great company with Stacy and Gretchen when it comes to you know smooth face. So I'll go over on this side for, for a little while. Um, what did you have to get through uh, the last three months and, and how do you do it? Uh, I. I I started in this industry in 1982. Uh, I'm, I'm coming up uh, on 38 years uh, in aviation. And frankly, I think many of us would say we've never seen anything like this. Um, and hopefully we never will again after we get through it. From an organizational standpoint, uh, we all practice what it would take if we have to have continuity of operations and work remotely and do some things on a very finite, short scale, a week, couple weeks due to a weather event, due to some other type of technical failure or whatnot. But to think about trying to run an operation, in our case, like an airport, uh, remotely uh, in many respects, um, is not obviously the easiest thing to do. We have about 600 or so employees at the, at the airport that work for the county. We did have about 20,000 employees that worked at the airport um, with all of our stakeholder partners, airlines and, and agencies and whatnot, um, and our staff. Two thirds of that 600 is still public facing. They're at the airport each and every day, working the front lines, making sure that our airport is safe and secure and moving forward. Uh, and about a third or about 200 of our folks are working remotely. Uh, I'm gonna say it's been one of those situations where we're learning as we go sometimes, um, how to keep things moving uh, and not lose a, lose a beat. Uh, and unfortunately, and I'm sure we'll talk about this this morning, uh, just when you think you start to see maybe a little bit of light at the tunnel, uh, cruel fate will push back down on you and say, you're not done uh, here. Uh, the virus is not over with you just yet. And we're going to continue to have to uh, manage our way through this as best we can. Uh, learning to the new normal, uh, remotely, contactless uh, issues, uh, trying to make sure that we are disinfecting, clean, safe, it is different, uh, and I think that as we as we get through this, it may actually survive after the, the virus is done and gone. It will, in fact, be a new normal. Yeah, thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. Stacy, I mean, you're in the contact business, right? You <laughs> you literally are needing to meet people in order to do business with them and that sort of thing. We just talked about it uh, a second ago. This is the largest group that we have met with in a long time. So tell me a little bit, how has that impacted your operation? Well, I, I, I guess the, the best word I can say is that we, we the tours ministry in general has just been devastated by this. Um, half of the tourism workers in Broward County have lost their jobs. 
um, in just four months. It took less than four months for that half to lose their jobs and tourism fuels our economy here in Broward County. So um, it's been devastating. We have adapted. Um, we are also working mostly remotely. Most of the CVB is working remotely. And we find that it's actually working very, very well, which is nice. Um, that's something that we didn't expect. So that's been a positive outcome of this, that we can work remotely and be effective at that. But we find that um, the, the most beneficial we can be is to make sure that our industry partners continue to be informed on what's going on. So we have industry-wide newsletters that go out on a regular basis to let people know what's going on with COVID-19 and how it's affecting Broward County, what that means for our marketing promotion from the CVB, both at a regional and national as well as international level. Um, we have come up with a safe and clean pledge, which I'll talk about a little later. We've, uh, we felt that one of the best things we could do is help the restaurant industry when they closed down. Um, and so we have done an extraordinary job on social media, letting everyone know what's open, which restaurants are open for takeout and delivery. Now some of them are open for in-house uh, in dining as well. So it has been challenging, but um, I'm a firm believer, and I know this is going to sound really trite, but I'm a firm believer that every challenge is an opportunity. And this is an opportunity for us to rise to the occasion, and I think that we are doing that. Well, I thank you very much for, for all the information that you have shared with the industry. It was so valuable that we had one anchor that actually communicated with us all the time. So thank you, Stacy, for that. Uh, Gretchen, I've been to the government center, and I mean, you have tight quarters over there. How did you deal with this situation, and how did you pivot in doing business differently now? Well, bes besides just the mobility advancement program and, and the adjustments that we needed to make, because of course we're in the nascent stages of implementation. And what that means is taking over $150 million worth of county and municipal projects to the oversight board per an agreement um, that required a great deal of briefing and detail all delivered virtually and trying to come up with ways that we could accommodate the needs of our oversight board members and all 29 municipalities to participate virtually in discussions about their projects, um, detailed discussions uh, that happened over the course of two days. And just no, our, our normal way of operating from an oversight board perspective had to be adjusted overnight. Uh, the, t the timing for getting these projects approved moved just slightly. Uh, but we also tried to do the best we could to work from home as much as possible. Uh, we have a very small team because we are still in the implementation stages. So it was possible for us to socially distance when we did need to be physically present with one another. But, um, you know, the transportation industry, our transit services, our public works department, what they're trying to do as far as um, keeping jobs, move, keeping these capital projects moving, keeping uh, our economy stimulated has been one of the things that we've been focusing on as much as possible at these very difficult times. I, I can see that, Gretchen. Thank you so much. Jonathan, newest kid on the block. You've been here now about two weeks, right? So you come in with a completely different perspective because you were in Mississippi before and now you came here and you could actually see what you had implemented in Mississippi and then what, what was implemented here. So from a port operation, what, what did you notice from operational standpoint in, in conducting business and, and being able to operate? Were you impressed with the operation? I was. And again, first thing, as, as you thanked Glenn uh, and the entire team for the work that they did, uh, they held everything uh, together during extremely trying times. Uh, situations would change, not just day to day, but oftentimes within 15 minutes or so, any mandate you're, that you're following ultimately could be changed. Uh, it was interesting. Uh, I interviewed for the position about two weeks before everything kind of broke loose uh, during that situation. Uh, it's a very different world uh, right now that we're having to respond to. Uh, it, I think luckily for me, though, the consistency between the facilities, what we were doing both on the federal and the state level were very similar, whether it's in Mississippi or whether it's in, in Broward County. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of what we were doing, and I think I was fortunate at the time to be able to watch and talk with a lot of the staff, talk with a lot of the leaders in this region, and take best management practices from what was occurring down here, as well as taking that back and putting it into, uh, into practice in, in Mississippi. Uh, and, and watching very closely, even though it was silent, the announcement was not made. You know, decisions were made ultimately for safety and security. We didn't know how ultimately 
how it, it was being spread, how that close contact would occur. Are we wearing face masks? Are we not wearing face masks? Ultimately, whether it's an industrial facility, whether it's whether it's what's occurring with the CVB or with transportation, it's all about the people and it's about keeping the people safe. We needed to maintain our operations, especially on the on the cargo side, on the petroleum side. We all know what happened on the, on the cruise side. You had to maintain safety, you had to maintain security. At no point could security ever be ever be mismanaged. We needed to maintain that. And then ultimately the decision-making process that was necessary when you take and put the humanitarian aspects in it as well. And, and that was something I was certainly, uh, when the decisions were made to be able to help those lines that were still out to be able to get the passengers on shore, uh, it was not an easy decision. We went through the same thing as we went from zero cruise ships in Mississippi all of a sudden to having four there. Uh, so we got thrown into, a, into an entirely different situation. Uh, but ultimately, you know, the, those decisions were made after careful planning, working with the staff, working with Broward County, with the commission and the decisions they made, and ultimately coming forth with, uh, with good decisions. They continued to change. We'll talk about that a little bit more today as some of the practices uh, that we have put in place are going to survive this pandemic, some of the cleaning, some of the activities associated with our operations. And as, as Stacy said, through through sometimes catastrophe can come opportunities. I think we'll come out of this, especially in our operations, probably better uh, than we went into it. Some of these practices are going to survive and I think that's going to be a good thing long term. Yeah, uh, Jonathan, I totally concur. I, I, I believe there will be certain protocols that will stick forever and there will be certain protocols that will be just temporary. So here's bad news and good news. Bad news is we have a heat lamp on South Florida. We're beaming up currently in COVID-19 cases, which really has uh, grabbed a national spotlight. Not good for us, right? Here's the good news. All residents in South Florida are now committed in acting responsible, which is great news for us, right? Because for the economic engine drivers that we all are, we need the buy-in from all of our residents and all of our communities to act responsibly in order to nip this in the butt, to be very frank, right? But you know, Mark, I wanna turn it to you. How is this impacting passenger travel? And do you have somewhat of an idea uh, what will this mean through the end of the year and maybe even 2021? So we've taken a look and talked to our stakeholders, uh, the airlines, uh, our concessions, rental car agencies, all our business partners, uh, and frankly, the traveling public to try to gauge where is this all going? Um, everybody wants to be able to forecast what does recovery look like um, in many different sectors, in hospitality and tourism, in, in international travel, uh, and, and then getting out into other segments of industry, whether it's business, healthcare, life sciences and whatnot. What, how are we all managing through this process? Is it going to be a V? Is it going to be, as some people refer to, as the Nike swoosh? Um, or is it going to be something uh, incredibly different? Um, you just made reference to the fact that there is a not just a spotlight on South Florida, um, but we're seeing surge all throughout the United States. We had a horrible, horrible March and April, um, as everybody um, can attest to in our various lines of, of business. We started to see life come back in the month of May and even a little bit more so in the month of June. I liken it to say, we were doing really, really great. As you indicate, we were on fire. Great plans, soaring, break, breaking records. In our case, fastest growing airport in the United States, several years running. It's if you had a dollar and all of a sudden Somebody took that dollar away and you had a nickel. That's how much traffic dropped. And when you see something come back, people get excited, they get motivated. They see uh, um, something coming back that they wanted uh, and, and had before. In our case, it was going from a nickel to a dime. It's like, okay, we're on our way now. And that's been gradually increasing. We're seeing some of the traffic come back. We're still probably about 65% down today on our passenger traffic about 50% down on flight operations. Some airlines have chosen to respect a little bit more social distancing, others not. One of the things we'll probably talk about this morning is in the aviation industry, airports and airlines and social distancing don't mix very well in that business model. Um, 
We're very hopeful that the recovery would continue. And by the end of this year, we would be back to about 50% of where we were in 2019. But this latest surge is throwing all of that into a realm of uncertainty. We're just not sure where it's going to go. On our best forecast, we probably were going to come in about hmm, 16, 17 million passengers for the year when in 2019, we had nearly 37 million passengers a year. So while we were working in the right direction, we do think that this is gonna be somewhat of an elongated recovery, and a lot of it's gonna be premised on what's happening on the medical front. Are we tamping down the virus? Are there great therapeutics and potentially a vaccine on the horizon? In order to still that, that, that public confidence back and get people back into the sky, into our hotels, onto cruise ships, uh, all of our industries are so interconnected, that one little blip uh, in, in any one of those arenas will cause uh, the other to, to possibly uh, stumble or trip a little bit. So hopeful, but I would say that it's tenuous. It's it, Anything can, can trip us up right now, but we're gonna keep our nose to the grindstone here. Thank you, Mark. Stacy. we feel his pain, don't we? Oh, God, I, yes. I tell you, when you <laughs> talked about the 95% less air, air passengers coming through, uh, that directly affected the hotels, the hotel industry, and then also the restaurant business, of course, and the attractions that we have. Um, you know, when I take a look at, at you, 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 you have the ability to market a short-term strategy for the next six months, right? Um, tell us a little bit about what you could do from the CVB, because the crystal ball is pretty foggy out there for 2021 and 2022, right? But what can you do on a short-term basis and what have you done? Well, we're focusing on the drive market, um, overwhelmingly focused on the drive market. And I would tell you that two months ago when we started our recovery, we were focusing on a drive market that included most of the Southeast all the way up to Nashville. Since the surge here, spike, whatever we're calling it, um, we've pulled back on that to now the drive market is just the state of Florida. Um, we, we, we figure that people from Florida may very well travel within state. There's no quarantine issues for us. If we travel to others, if we travel to other states right now, there's quarantine issues. So there wouldn't be any of those. Um, so 300 miles, give or take, is where we are focused. Um, we had we had a phased in recovery plan with the drive market southeast first, and then we were going to go up to the northeast in phase two once New York got it under control. And of course, now New York has it under control, and we seem to not. Uh, so that's changed significantly. We don't expect people to come here from the Northeast right now because when they go home, they'll have to quarantine for two weeks. So it's drive market. Half of our traffic came through the airport pre-COVID. Uh, that's clearly been significantly reduced. So we, we think the Great American Road Trip though is back. We think Americans will get in the car and they'll drive and they'll see more of the country um, from the ground than they have in decades. And that's a positive thing. We're also a beach destination. And when you and when you see what is the number one search on search engines for, for vacations, beach is the number one word that's searched. So if you want a place that's wide open, we are not crammed. People do not live on top of each other here in Greater Fort Lauderdale. If you want a beach destination where you can get out in the open and spend some time in the fresh air, we think we are the perfect place. And if you are in Orlando, or someplace that is landlocked and you want to get to a beach, there's no better place to come than us. And that's how we're marketing it. But yeah. we're doing it, we're doing it softly. We're, it's not a hard sell. We don't want to appear tone deaf. We realize what's happening. We understand what's going on in the marketplace and what people are seeing here um, on the headlines. We understand that. But that doesn't mean you stop. You just you just pivot. Yeah, you know, I, I really enjoyed how you guys shifted your marketing effort and, and you really blew up social media. I mean, locally and in the state, you were everywhere. It was amazing. Actually, as you were talking in, in my crazy head, as I have it, uh, this, this hashtag just jumped into my head. Uh, road trip to the Riverside, shameless plug, sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm going to move on to Jonathan while I have you over there. We'll make there. sure it trends, Heiko. We'll make sure it trends. <laughs> Jonathan. The port is undergoing a master plan, a construction project that we have never, ever, ever seen in the port. And I, I can only imagine how complex that is, especially with the conditions that we are currently in. How have you been able and the team been able to balance this construction project to move forward and keeping everybody happy that is involved? Uh, tell us a little bit. I mean, that must have been just uh, a very difficult task, in my opinion. 
we're engaged in this in this construction program to keep our tenants, to keep our partners happy in so in so many respects. It's a master plan that is responding to the needs of the of the industry uh, at all levels. When you take a look, this is a very comprehensive plan. Allows us the opportunity to get into capital programming and construction programs within our cargo, within our petroleum, uh, as well as certainly within within the cruise market. Uh, again, you look at kind of an, an, an opportunity. You oftentimes don't have the chance to engage in large-scale construction projects when things are slow. Unless you're working on a pure greenfield location, you don't have the opportunity. We don't have the luxury. We're trying to do a significant amount of construction in the middle of an operating port. So though we've seen a little bit of a downturn, uh, there's still consistent movement uh, through here. Uh, the container count is down. I think we're anticipating probably being down about 25% uh, by the end of the year. Uh, and that's purely within our, within our container market. Uh, we are taking advantage of that. Uh, we have not slowed down. We've ac actually taken opportunities to accelerate uh, the program. We've made some additional investments uh, so that we can get some additional equipment online get the areas in, this, in the Southport turning notch, get them dug out quicker. Our biggest issue right now, because we have seen a little bit of a downturn in the construction market uh, in South Florida, is how do we get rid of the dirt? How do we get rid of the material that's being pulled out? So if you drive down there right now, you're gonna see large piles of, of dirt. Uh, so while we're accelerating the program, there's a little bit of a difficulty on the other side. We'll deal with that though. Uh, within that, I think uh, the staff we continue to need to work with, uh, with the members of, of the Port Everglades Association, work with the people that are on site. We're taking their suggestions. If they see there's an opportunity for us to change traffic flows, traffic patterns a little bit, we're going to, we're going to do that. Ultimately, it really has been a, has been a wonderful partnership uh, from, our, from our construction team, our planning team, the port staff, but I really want to applaud the uh, the efforts of, of, of our tenants down in, in that location as well. If there's an opportunity, just because we're not moving people through the cruise terminals, it doesn't mean that we just shut off the lights and we leave. These facilities need to be ready at a moment's notice. And so we continue to have our, our, our terminal operations team, our maintenance team out on site, making sure and we're sitting in one of them today. Uh, certainly within a couple of days, moving a couple of things around, maybe a little bit more cleaning, Certainly, we're maintaining all of our sanitization standards, even though we don't have a lot of people moving through here. Uh, we're taking advantage of this situation. It's unfortunate, but we cannot stop our capital programs just because we are facing, uh, facing this. It's going to come back. The business is going to come back. How quickly? I think there's a lot of factors associated with that, and we'll find that out. But we can't stop the expansion program just because there's a little bit of a downturn in the economy. We need to be able to respond in the future uh, when things do come back. I like your long-term vision there, Jonathan. That sounds like you're going to be here for a long time. I, certain, I certainly hope so. Yes. So in, anyways, Gretchen, even though that Jonathan is my new best friend, I cannot tell you how thrilled I am that you are part of this group now because you are working on something that I have a very difficult time understanding. I went to one of your PowerPoint presentations that you uh, did, uh, I think, at Tropical Acres. And I went through about 20 of your slides and my head was literally spinning. How did you all come up with a 30 year program like this? Because it's utterly complex. It is very complex and it has so many bells and whistles. And you know, when, when I think about how fast technology moves, I looked at your last slides that you had on, on that presentation, it was just mesmerizing. So just maybe educate the audience how you developed the plan and then how did we get the voters to vote for it? Sure, um, it is a very complex plan because it's project-based and it's not just five or six major capital projects, it's 1,400 projects over 30 years. And some of them are very small. Uh, we have over 700 municipal projects that are in the plan. We have 26.7 miles of rail to be determined where it will go. Uh, and a lot of transit infrastructure improvements and transit oriented development opportunities that are in the plan. One of the things that I think you're referring to from that slide deck is the investment in innovation. And being forward thinking enough and having folks on our team that said, make sure that you have money in each year of this plan escalating over time to be able to adapt 
to new, to new technologies as they come to market to test those technologies against one another to see which ones are going to perform better in the characteristics of perhaps a downtown Fort Lauderdale versus a suburban. Because Broward County has so many different characteristics and we have our municipalities that are trying to build city centers and they're interested in doing smart city technology, but being able to test those technologies and determine which ones are most resilient, um, how do they operate from a safety perspective, making sure that we're protecting the privacy of individuals because smart city technology, of course, uh, contemplates the adaptation of 5G and sensors and, and video technology and making sure that people are prepared, um, that they can accept the, the changes that are coming to their communities and that they feel safe. Um, so all of those things are part of the plan. And we worked with FDOT. Uh, they brought in some consultants nationally to work with us. We obviously looked at all of the existing plans. We've been kind of waiting for the master plans to come out from the port and the airport, which we now have so that we can start working with our partners there as well on perhaps a port to airport connection at some point. And so there are a lot of really uh, exciting opportunities. Uh, and one of the biggest things that I, I think is helpful at a time of COVID-19 is that there were a lot of shovel ready projects in that plan. And we were able to advance those projects and try to get them out the door in fiscal year 2020, uh, specifically to try to stimulate the economy at this difficult time. Amazing. My head is still spinning, you know, and one of your slides was about autonomous vehicles. I was thinking, OK, now we're going to have autonomous vehicles that are single eggs with UV lights that disinfect you and get you from point A to point B. But that's, okay, that's a whole other question. Um, while, while I'm going on to safety, I'm just going to go to Stacy and Mark and, and, and Jonathan. And I start with the two gentlemen first. Uh, I, I tell you, and, and for our hotel industry in particular, we have worked so hard to create a safe environment, you know, from adapting to different uh, protocol measures and sanitation and, and disinfecting, using new technology, whether it's electrostatic uh, fogging, whether it is uh, ozone machines that are in air filter or in, in HVAC units and what, what have you, right? For, for the port and for, for the airport, what have you done in order to create a really safe in environment for our customers that then will benefit Stacy to get this message out because she needs to market that out that that we are safe i walked through the airport the other day and i tell you i felt safe i felt great i'm sorry i did not walk through the port i didn't have a reason to walk through the port but but when I walked through the airport, I was so impressed how everything was lined up. The social distancing protocols were in place. Everybody was wearing face masks. So, Mark, why don't we start with the airport? Um, what, what have you done in order to create a safe environment for our passengers and our residents and our visitors? You know, it, it's it, some of it you would say is not rocket science, but clearly you have to be able to demonstrate to our patrons that your facilities are safe they're gonna be safe when they travel through. How do you do that? And there's a number of different programs that, that we have put in place in order to try to get that across. Back in early June, we started a public uh, awareness and safety campaign to instill confidence. Uh, we, we, we take a runoff of our FLL acronym and we've added a Y onto it. So we have now a fly safer, fly smarter, fly better campaign. And, and we have a terrific uh, public information team that's put together an entire social media package. We're on YouTube, we all uh, through our websites, we're on Twitter and, and Facebook and, and pushing the word out about all the different things that we have been working on at the airport in the messaging of when you're ready to fly, we're ready for you and it's safe. So the things that you've mentioned in terms of regularly cleaning and disinfecting high touch points and the floors and the HEPA filters and, and the uh, HVAC systems and whatnot. We're testing ultraviolet lights now in escalators to clean handrails, uh, the electrostatic cleaning, the foggers in restrooms, and doing that on a highly repetitive basis to make sure that we're, we're staying, uh, uh, the, staying very, very clean. We've installed acrylic uh, shields all throughout the airport at ticket counters, um, announcements uh, going on throughout there. And we recently took delivery of uh, 1.5 million face masks 
that we received from FEMA. We make them available to the public if they do not have a, a face mask. Um, we, we have them available at our information booths and we'll, we'll, uh, we have roving patrols. If you don't have one, you need one nowadays to fly. And, and we want to make sure that, that we're, we're reaching out to everybody uh, to help protect each other. I have to say, and, and, and I think we all deal with this, that there are some folks who are just highly uncomfortable with a face mask. Um, but, but you know that if an airline's going to require it, if it's going to be required through uh, county emergency orders and whatnot, you need to wear it. And we want to try to uh, do our part to make it uh, available. Uh, we watch and patrol our facilities. As of today, I have to say that, that we have really great, great compliance from the traveling public. I mean, I watch on our CCTV monitors, people going all throughout the, when they're in transit, they have those face masks on. So we're, we're proud that the message you get through, hopefully everybody uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the effort of staying socially distanced. And when you can't, make sure you're wearing a face mask. We're seeing a great response from our traveling public and we hope that it stays that way. So it's a team effort. Uh, our maintenance teams, our social media teams, our, our operations and security teams, everybody's rowing this boat in the same direction to instill confidence that we are, we are clean and safe and we're ready for the traveling public. That's great. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, that must have been an undertaking just to do that at the airport. Uh, at the port, you, you just created floating docks and had everybody just uh, on, on open air. What, what did you do in, in protocols at the port in order to keep everybody that's working here safe and everybody that's coming to the port safe? Sure. First of all, Mark, I, I applaud your efforts. Having, having moved through your facility during this time, during the pandemic, uh, and, and watching, and I've been through several airports during this period of time, the work that you're doing, the work that your staff is doing, again, I, I feel extremely safe uh, flying in, uh, flying out and, and have no problems. It's one part of, I think, a, a larger approach, though, when you consider uh, the flying public, the cruising public, they need to feel safe. They need to feel that what we're doing at all touch points, uh, if, if you look at, at from the time that they leave their home, whether they're driving in, whether in this case, flying in, they need to feel good when they leave their home. They start out with a mask, they disinfect, they're at their home airport, they arrive in Fort Lauderdale, they arrive at Mark's facility. Uh, from that point, they take some form of transportation onto the port site. So within that, what we need to do is make sure that that transportation corridor, really from the time that they arrive in Broward County to the time that they get on their ship, that's our responsibility. Within that, it really needs to be a transmission or containment corridor that allows us the opportunity to be as safe and secure as is possible. Again, there's the safety associated with the pandemic, but there's also also the security issue. We cannot waylay and we cannot push aside the safety concerns. Certainly it has occurred so, so long ago. That's our new normal in security. We're going to have a new normal associated with, with healthcare. Uh, within that, we've made sure, and, and we have to work hand in hand with the cruise lines, with the users of our port facilities, unfortunately. There's still a no sale order. Uh, we don't anticipate, and we certainly hope that we're going to see the cruise lines uh, returning. Uh, we do have a bit of a prototype that we're involved in right now is that our ferry service uh, between Fort Lauderdale and the Bahamas uh, has opened up. Uh, July 2nd uh, was the first service, the Bali area uh, activities associated with that. And though their numbers are low right now, comparatively, uh, they are buoyed and very, very excited about being able to get that service uh, back on. They fall underneath that 250 passenger threshold. Because of that, they don't fall under those CDC, those stringent guidelines. But it's allowed us, us to be able to look at Terminal 21 and be able to put the plexiglass guards in to be able to establish social distancing at a lower level. Uh, we've taken some of the best management practices that we see at the airport, some of the other facilities. We are putting them in place. Uh, and we've also put in kind of a, a last a last resort opportunity to get your safety uh, equipment. Uh, and there's a pharmaceutical box just outside of Terminal 21. So if you've forgotten your mask, if you've forgotten some of your toiletries, if you need some disinfectant, disinfectant there's an opportunity to be able to get that before you get on the vessel. Now, there are other aspects of, of traveling on that ferry. You have to have a, uh, a COVID-free test. Uh, at a certain time before you do board. 
So how that's going to translate into the cruise industry, we don't know as of yet. I will tell you that the work that's going on with our, with our tenants right now, we make sure that we get it out in front. We communicate with them on a consistent basis. Anytime there's a new emergency order uh, that comes about from, uh, from uh, our government offices, we make sure that that gets out, gets properly translated, answer any questions as may be necessary. Glenn, the team before my arrival, and we continue to do that, uh, we're getting out in front of things, making sure the information is in front of them as, as quickly as possible. But we need to be extremely nimble uh, within this. Unfortunately, as, as we talked about before, the conditions from CDC and the other government agencies, those things that happen that we're doing right now may change uh, tomorrow. And we just don't know how this is going to behave. So we need to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to contain, but being able to change at a moment's notice. Thank you, Jonathan. So Stacy. Wow, that is a lot of information that you just got from the airport, just from the port, and you have visited many of the hotels and restaurants already, and you've seen what everybody is doing. How do you create a story around this? How do you bundle this? How do you market this, actually? Um, what, what are your plans, or what are you doing, actually, with this information now? Well, we've also created our own. Uh, the CAB has its own safe and clean pledge plan. Uh, you can take the pledge if you go to sunny.org and you are basically agreeing to follow CDC guidelines that relates to wearing masks and washing your hands and social distancing. And um, if you are a business and you don't have to be in the travel industry, but if you're a business that takes a safe and clean pledge, we'll give you a poster to put in your, whether it's office, restaurant, hotel, the Riverside has been all over social media with our safe and clean pledge and we appreciate that. And then you are giving an extra layer of safety and security to your clients or your customers. Um, so we push it out as best we can. We, you know, all of the metrics, um, all the surveys suggest that the new luxury in travel is safety. And because of that, uh, we know that it's people's number one issue. Six months ago, if you asked the traveling public what their number one issue was, it would not have been hand sanitizer. It wouldn't have been face mask wearing. And in fact, I've traveled the world and I've seen other countries where their residents wear face masks. And I've always said, why are they doing that? Now I understand why they're doing that. So um, that's become normal for us. Uh, and you, we're not the only destination doing it. Every destination, every CVB, every, every DMO is, is trying to say we are the safest destination to come to. But on top of, again, and, and I'll reiterate this, on top of the safety and security measures, the hotels, the restaurants, the attractions, the seaport, the airport have put in place, we're an open air destination. And we have found that along with beaches, people want to go where there's no crowds. They want to be able to socially distance. And you can do that 365 days a year here. Um, and, and we think that that is also something that is a marketable um, issue that we can push out there that suggests that not only are we safe and clean and despite the numbers i believe that most Broward county residents are following the rules we are tr we are being responsible but we are also a state of 21 million people so you have to expect that with the state of 21 million people you're going to get a large a, a higher rate of infection that in Broward County, um, despite what's being pushed out there by the media, and of course we don't have the bully platform that the media has, but we do the best we can to, to let people know that it's safe and clean and open air and socially distancing, and you can come here and you can still have the time of your life. And we're less expensive now than we were six months ago. So for us, you know, come. I thought the, the safe and clean pledge was just awesome. Uh, I went into even non-hospitality business where there was a poster in, in their businesses uh, that, that just picked it up from your website and they said, look, we are all in this together, which is great. One of, our, one of, our, one of the last businesses, one of the uh, most recent businesses to sign up was Two Men in a Truck. They're a moving company. Um, but we were thrilled that they took the safe and clean pledge because it doesn't matter. You don't, it, everybody, not just the traveling public, everybody thinks that safe clean are the, are the number one issues for all of us. I mean, how many of us used to go and put our hands on a handrail and never think twice about it? Now we do. And I think that as my colleagues here have suggested, many of these protocols are going to last. And that's a good thing. Yeah. Audience, I want to just direct you to a website, which is www.sunny.org forward slash pledge. And go ahead and take the pledge. I'm going to put Stacy on the spot. She will mail you actually a poster oh. that you can put up in your business. Yeah. So take the pledge. We'll hand deliver them, Heiko. Mail, we'll hand deliver them. 
She will hand deliver it. What are we saying? So, so Gretchen, you think Gretchen, you you thought you were off the hook right now, right? But I'm going to have to tell you, what you have done with the mobility plan in South Florida is just second to none. I have never seen so much social distancing on I-95 in my entire <laughs> life. And I actually can come from Miami to Broward in 20 minutes versus driving an hour. You, you're amazing. I don't know how you came up with the plan, but it was great. All right, all kidding aside, right? Your plan has actually an economic development benefit, right? It will grow our economy. That's why I think it's so important that you're here. And it will also help actually the airport, the port, and our visitors as well. Explain that to us a little bit. Sure. Um, one of the main components of the 30-year plan is a 30% investment on all eligible projects in certified business enterprise. So that's our CBE program, uh, a local small business program. And back in uh, September of 2018, before the surtax actually went to the voters, the, uh, the Broward County commissioners unanimously supported placing a what we think is a pretty ambitious 30% CBE goal uh, on the project on the program over the 30 years. We want to reinvest these local tax dollars um, back into our community. We want to build capacity. We understand that delivering the number, again, when you're talking about having a project-based plan, um, you also have to talk about the capacity to deliver those types of projects. And of course, you know, we are competing with our other economic engines and uh, other municipalities and the private sector in capital projects and making sure that we have the capacity here locally to do that is incredibly important. And that's why bringing in our small businesses, utilizing our CBEs, connecting those CBEs to our larger firms and helping to grow our capacity and our knowledge locally is one of the ways that we think we're gonna be able to deliver on time and within budget. The other important economic development component is the opportunity to do some transit-oriented development, um, creating affordable uh, a housing uh, that's connected to low-cost, high-capacity transportation. And obviously, we have a disruptor. COVID-19 uh, is making high-capacity uh, transportation options less viable for the moment. And so that safe and clean pledge and making sure that we are doing everything that we possibly can in the public transportation arena to bring people back, make them feel safe um, and, and make public transportation a viable option again is incredibly important to us. And you know, we know that our essential workers, uh, this is an economic development opportunity for them too. The more options they have, um, we are a service sector economy here and making sure that we're creating the best the highest quality and the lowest cost transportation options for our service sector is incredibly important to the program as well. Thank you, Gretchen. It was interesting in one of your presentations, this was a different presentation that I looked through. Uh, actually, our senior citizens is one of the most fastest growing age bracket in Broward County. I, I was just actually surprised that it really was, but uh, they are gonna be, they're gonna have to rely on, tr on transportation as well. And so I'm glad that you're working towards this, Stacy. I love me a big party. You know that. I like a good concert. I like uh, great events. I love to go to the boat show. Hopefully don't buy a boat, but sometimes, you know, you can't resist. What, what is going to happen to all of these events? Are they actually going to take place this year, next year? Uh, and and how, how do you work this out? Uh, the boat show is on schedule for the end of October of 20. Um, they have protocols that they're putting in place to provide for social distancing and um, also cleaning protocols. Uh, so they're, they're doing their boat show. Um, but the CVB has made a policy decision that we won't be financially supporting large events like uh, music festivals um, through, the end of, through the calendar end of this year. Uh, we don't think that we want to be the destination that has super spreader events. 
and we're very concerned with that. Um, we, we made this decision earlier this summer, but um, nothing that's happened in the past month has changed our mind that it was the correct decision to make. In addition to that, um, and, and we're, we're saddened by that because some of those uh, large beach events are what put us on the map, uh, but we also understand that people aren't, may not be comfortable in October and November even going to a beach concert with 60,000 people. Uh, so again, you gotta be sensitive to people's, where, where, where people are in their heads right now. Um, so that's unfortunate, but the, the truth of the matter is that with a 30% budget cut, going from $22 million to $14 million in the next fiscal year, uh, you have to make some hard decisions. And one of those hard decisions was not, not promoting and sponsoring those large events through the rest of uh, the, the calendar year. We were fortunate at the CVB that we had six really, really good months here in Brad County for our fiscal year from October 1 until the middle of March. We were doing incredibly well, which will offset some of um, some of the losses that we might have had that other destinations have had, which are more significant than ours. But still, you know, an eight, an eight million dollar budget cut, a third of your budget is pretty serious. And um, as a result, we've just decided to take that position. Yeah, Stacey, that's a tough decision when you don't have the TDT coming in, the Tourist Development Act coming in like before. Uh, there are some tough decisions that you had to make, you know, so kudos for leading that. Uh, Mark, you know, people call me cheap, but I call myself frugal. Your airport low-cost carriers, I love it. <laughs> I really love it, you're right. Uh, and, but I'm worried. I'm worried to the, to the extent, Mark, that with this pandemic and with the lack of revenue that you have uh, gotten through the airport, that we may see that prices for flights are going up and you have some incredible legacy carriers. What's happening in that? Do, do you foresee a change in pricing? Uh, and uh, are there certain struggles that you're dealing with? Huge struggles. Um, I guess I would, I would probably characterize this under the, the header, keeping it real. Um, references to FLL being a low cost airport and, and, and Lord knows we've, we've had that reputation for a long time. And we've been blessed with a plethora of, of uh, high quality, uh, low cost or lower cost airlines um, who have really done a phenomenal job of, of making Fort Lauderdale and our uh, greater Broward area their home. Um, Gretchen used the term disruptor. We, we have been hit with probably the biggest disrupt, disruptor we've ever, ever had. And, and you will see cost structures starting to change. Our business model at the airport, the reason why we are low cost isn't necessarily because we have low cost airlines. That helps. But our cost structure in, in large part has been, uh, has been geared off of non-airline revenue sources, parking, rental cars, concessions, when they do well, it keeps our cost components low, the piece that the airlines have to pick up. The, the statistics that I threw at you earlier, uh, when we were down 95, 97% on rental cars or in parking, the 11,250 parking spaces at the airport, certain days I only had 300 cars uh, parked in there. The outcome of losing that revenue has to come from somewhere if we're going to maintain an operational airport, which means airlines might have to pick up a larger share of the expenditures going forward. And in order to do that, in this day and age of where some airlines are trying to hold that social distancing and others aren't, um, Southwest has committed to keeping the social distance, blocking that middle seat until the end of, of uh, September, Delta till the end of September, JetBlue till middle of September but some aren't doing it right now. Um, you know, when you can't fill the airplane, then you're gonna have to find a way to cover the cost for that flight some way or another. As I said, it's not a really sustainable business model to fly an airplane two thirds full for the rest of time. Hopefully uh, we'll make advances in, in how we combat the virus. But in the meantime, airports and airlines have to figure out together how are we going to cover the expenditures of, of running an airport? When the, when the pandemic really started to take hold, we started shutting down portions of the airport. We sealed off about 45% of the airport's uh, infrastructure. We closed Concourse A, we closed half of G, we closed half of C, we closed all of Terminal or Concourse F rather. 
But when airlines are now starting to put planes back in, where those planes are not entirely full, but we need the gates, we actually have to open up portions of the concourses and terminals that were previously closed, which means we have to clean them, we have to air condition them, we have to do all the different things, which makes costs go, but we don't have that traction with passengers coming through at high volumes just yet. So it's going to be really um, uh, tricky to watch not only what happens on our side uh, in terms of, of uh, controlling our expenditures and, and where we're going to go, um, but come September, uh, the airlines are going to be faced with some decisions when some of the federal grant monies that they've received start to run out and they have to make some decisions about whether they lay people off or they sit airplanes down and, and whatnot. As when I used that term tenuous a little bit earlier, uh, I, I truly meant it. We, we have a period of time here in the next several months that we have to watch the airline industry uh, and the aviation industry as a, as a whole very, very carefully to see whether or not there's going to be additional help that comes out of Congress or uh, the, the industry is going to have to adapt and move in a different direction. That will have ramifications on our facility and how we operate um, transportation facilities across, the, across America. But it, it is, uh, it's something that we are kind of like holding our breath, uh, hoping for medical science to really save us here a little bit. Uh, and in the absence of that, we're hopeful that Congress, and we've gone back to the congressional leaders and said, uh, airports received $10 billion as part of a CARES Act uh, a program earlier this year, which greatly helped, but it's not going to carry us that far into the future. We're going to need more, I think, going forth in the future if, if this thing doesn't get resolved quickly. Great. Thank you, Mark. Well, uh, you will have my loyalty. Uh, I, will, I will go through FLL. You know, Jonathan, it just dawned on me and it just hit me because I just read in my mind through your CV again. And when I read through your CV, it was really interesting that you have an economic development and business development background. You're not only a great port administrator, you actually have another skill set that you bring into the table. So let me throw you a curveball. I'm sorry you didn't have that question actually, but I'm going to throw you a curveball on this, right? I, I looked through your plan. You have a plan for, for the next, uh, not only 10 years, but for the next 20 years. And I've seen those projections for passenger growth, for cargo growth, and then also for your uh, petroleum projections. How are you gonna be able to get those goals done, number one? And my second question is, I just looked, Stacy and I, we just looked outside uh, and we just saw how beautiful it is. How are we gonna be environmentally conscious as well? You know, it's interesting. I'm going to take the environmental portion of it first, because for so many years, growth at ports was counter to environmental sensitivity. And that is no longer that is no longer the case, is that when you take a look and especially when you take a look at what Port Everglades has done uh, recently, if you read through when we got our record of decision from the Army Corps of Engineers, the stipulations and the conditions associated with securing that permit are, are exhaustive, uh, they're extensive, but they're doable. And they have to be in order for us to maintain that permit and for us to be able to go deeper and wider. Really the central part of it no longer is the depth, it's no longer the width, it's what you are going to do to maintain the environmental sensitivity of your dredging program. We have the opportunity to learn from some of the mistakes of the past from some of our counterparts uh, really throughout the United States. And when you take those best management practices and you put them in, uh, it makes it a little bit more expensive. And I will tell you, there's been a significant uptick in the overall cost of the dredging program. But as we sat around the table, it really does not impact the amount of cost on the local level. So we're in that 200 to $210 million local responsibility. The rest of the $509 million program is picked up by the federal government but they're requiring significant, significant uh, conditions associated with, uh, with the environmental conditions. Uh, ultimately, the turbidity is, is significant, making sure that not only the dredging process and removing that material, but once you put it into, into the barges for removal and send that off into open water or dredge disposal or some other manner, making sure that the curtains are down, making sure that you're not ending up with that pluming, making sure that those conditions are met. Now, the Army Corps of Engineers used to allow the dredging companies themselves to monitor. 
That is no longer the case. It's a third party that's coming in that's responsible to the Army Corps of Engineers to make sure that that monitoring uh, is complete. But it goes deeper than that. Ultimately, it goes to making sure that not only the dredging process, but the, the preparation that's necessary, maintaining the corals, making sure that those are moved, making sure that those are held, and making sure that those are replaced when necessary. If you look at the mangrove development program that we had, I, having to do that, having a port, an industrial facility, have to take that type of action was unheard of. The port took on that task and it really has become a model in environmental modeling and environmental mitigation. Now our mitigation plans will continue. Army Corps of Engineers will be working with a lot of other groups to make sure that, that we're not degrading the environment and that we're actually leaving the environment in a much better place. The fact that we receive such high marks as part of our Green Marine program, that's a voluntary environmental monitoring program Again, it's not something that's done where we, where we test it, but we bring outside monitors in that what we say that we're doing actually uh, is, being, is being done. But I think as well, you take a look at it and that's only part of it. And that's probably the most visible part of, of what we're doing associated with our, our capital program as well as our dredging program. Uh, but you, when you take a look at, at congestion mitigation, the opportunity to create not to, not to put that congestion, and there will be congestion associated with these programs. There will be more trucks, there will be more rail. How do we handle that? How do we take a look at our, at our external transportation infrastructure, look at our mobility, make sure that those mobility plans not only meet the industrial needs of the port, but the pasture needs of the port as well. When you look at the people mover, when you're looking at the, at the connection that could occur between the airport to the port, to the CBB and the expansion of our convention center, ultimately in getting downtown as well, we're looking at congestion mitigation as a whole. That then leads to a better quality of life, better quality of place, place and then moves into the economic development and community development aspect of it. Something I was so very pleased when, when I had the opportunity to interview uh, in February was meeting the members of, of the selection uh, panel. Uh, and the fact that they were looking at development within Broward County holistically. It wasn't about the airport. It wasn't about the convention center. It wasn't about the beaches. It wasn't about the port. It wasn't about mobility. It was about how we integrate together to ensure that Broward County, while it continues to advance, while it continues to grow, does not overwhelm the citizenry that we have here. Ultimately, all of us serve the citizens of Broward County. So how do we develop the county? How do we engage in economic development? How do we bring in new industry? How do we bring in new headquarters? At the same time, we don't overwhelm what is so wonderful about Broward County. I'm so excited to be here. And one of the reasons is I love it down here and I have yet to experience the festivals, the concerts, the activities that make Broward County and set us apart. Uh, when I had the opportunity to talk to people and they said, where are you moving? When I said I'm moving to South Florida, in particular Broward County, they were absolutely just enamored. How do I get there? I mean, this is a place I've looked at coming for a long period of time. Uh, so to have the opportunity to be down here professionally, but also personally, and be closer to uh, several members of my family, I mean, for me, it was a dream come true. And I see the holistic approach to economic development around here as being just such an exciting opportunity for us to be able to grow, create wealth, create job opportunities, uh, and ultimately uh, uh, be a better Brower. Jonathan, I, I just want to tell you, I, I just got goosebumps. I want you to jump out of my chair, <laughs> chest pump you, high five you. <laughs> He's a collaborator. Did you listen to him? He is a collaborator. I mean, at its best, and that's really what we need. That's what makes Broward so different than many other counties set out. We all work together. We put our egos aside at the doorstep and say, okay, so how are we going to make it better? You know, Gretchen, I want to throw something at you because you, you were talking about innovation the other day, you know, so I want you to go back to the future and I want to get on that hoverboard, you know, and just bypass traffic in order to get to meetings downtown, right? Do we see these uh, wireless gondolas up in the sky, you know, that take me from one place to another place? I don't know. But what do you see in technology coming on board first? Uh, what do you see in innovations that will, will actually make things different, make things better. Do you foresee there will be any disruptors as well? What do you see? Well, I think we're living through probably, as Mark pointed out, one of the greatest disruptors that any of us have experienced in our careers. 
And it's had a, a profound effect on the way that people move, um, not just airports, cruise lines, whether or not people are traveling and, and you know, tourism, but just people's desire to how they're going to go to work. So going back to uh, will I take public transportation? Will I get into a, um, a TNC with other people and do a shared ride? Will I make the sacrifice to spend a little extra money uh, to take a solo ride? And you know, what we also know is that for people who are living on the margins economically and have to try to maintain a, a car, it costs the average person $10,000 a year in South Florida to have a single vehicle. And if we can't find a way to make um, affordable transportation options available uh, and be innovative about that uh, in a safe manner, in a way that people uh, can embrace, then congestion, your, your experience on I-95 will be gone very soon when um, people are are back to work. And maybe maybe they won't come back to work. Maybe one of the disruptors is the way that people operate. Do we continue to operate from home? What happens uh, when the fall comes with the universities locally and our schools? Uh, what percentage of people are going to be working partially remotely? And the most important part of innovation from, from my perspective, and I think that our chief innovation officer uh, has, has made a few presentations about the importance of actually finding out what people are doing. We need to stop planning based on what we think is happening or what we have historically seen happen and start making decisions, especially around mobility, based on what is actually happening in real time and watching patterns and watching why patterns are changing and being able to iterate in real time and pivot, as I think you mentioned earlier. We need to have uh, a lot of different technologies being tested. We're looking at creating an innovation district, um, possibly more than one, so that we can work with the private sector and uh, across, again, collaboratively. It's one of the things that I really enjoy about the Mobility Advancement Program is it was built and implemented as a cross-functional collaboration. And that was purposeful because if we don't collaborate, not just within our own community, but across uh, into the region and find out what's happening and what's working and what's not, and make decisions very quickly uh, to be responsive to the public, um, then we're really not doing our job. Very cool. Stacy. you couldn't have planned it better. The convention center, I don't know how you knew it, how, how you knew when to take this thing down. And I, I just looked as I was driving by it, you know, the construction goes on apparently, but the timing was just perfect to do this. Well done, uh, Madam President. But tell me a little bit about uh, the convention center expansion continues, correct? And then um, is the the group and convention community excited about our convention center? Are we having some big fish, uh, pun intended, marlins or dolphins, whatever, smaller, bigger fish on, on the line that are ready to sign contracts? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, we're very excited that the expansion of the Broward County Convention Center and the hotel continues. Um, the, uh, the West expansion will be completed in October of 2021, um, which is very exciting. I, I posted some pictures on LinkedIn just over this weekend of, of, the, of the site. It looks like a construction site. People are working there six days a week, which is exciting. That is one of the things that Broward County, I think, has always done best is in times of economic difficulty, we kept people at work with our construction projects, whether it was the runway or the courthouse and now the convention center. So that's... That has an added benefit of keeping our unemployment numbers, while still high, not as high as they could have been. So yeah. So and also, I have the um, I have the honor of going around and saying that we didn't lose any convention center business because of the pandemic, because it's been closed. So while uh, it's truthful, it's truthful. Um, so the uh, the project should be completed in 2024. It is about a year, not the not the expansion, but with the hotel, it's about a year behind schedule. Having said that, as you well know, Heiko. Um, group business books 
many years in advance. And so for 24, 25, and 26, we have some very exciting, large 7th, 8,000 room night groups looking to book. Um, they're, I, I, I will not tell you who they are at this point in time. We're still negotiating with them, so um, I won't announce it. And we're also looking at some large sporting events, which are 10,000 plus room nights for the convention center, which would be huge for us. And again, these are at 24, 25, and 26. And I know for a lot of people, they don't understand or or think about how important it is to get that to get those um, groups on the books, even though it's three, four, five years in advance. That's fair. That's crucial for the for the um, the group industry. So that's very exciting for us. The hotel project continues. Uh, we, it's the first time we'll, we will have a headquarters hotel. It'll be an Omni, an 800 room Omni um, again, and we have Eastern expansion going on as well, which will be on the water. Um, the garage, half the garage is down. Um, at the port, the seaport, so you'll actually be able to see the water from a meeting room, which you cannot currently do, uh, because why wouldn't you want to see what we, the beauty of, of uh, Greater Fort Lauderdale here from a conference? And I will tell you that there has been a lot of conversation about what the future of the group business is. Will people congregate in five, six thousand pe person convention halls, you know, and, and currently, my staff and I are attending a virtual conference. Um, it is not the same. The networking, the face-to-face -face communication, most people in the travel industry are extroverts. We wanna be with people, we wanna talk to people, we wanna, we wanna have that person-to-person -person connection. It'll come back. There's no question it'll come back, but it won't come back until we have a vaccine or therapeutics. So um, by 24, <laughs> we'll be fine, I would think. But it's, 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 uh, it's an exciting project and it is an exciting time despite what is going on, an exciting time to be here in Broward County because there is so much that is happening. We are moving forward, we are progressing, and we will continue to do so because this county has experienced adversity in the past. It's used to it and it's used to powering through it. Very good, thank you, Stacy. Let me tell you guys, uh, let, let me just throw a question to all four of you guys at this point. And uh, when I take a look at the amazing projects that all of you guys are working on, these are multi, 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 multi million dollar projects. They're massive, right? They're beyond my piggy bank that I have at home, right? But when, when we think about this, right, do you foresee there are challenges to market them globally? And do you think that COVID-19 created a even playing field um, amongst your particular portion of the business? I'm going to start with Mark. First, I want to comment on the genius of Ms. Ritter to actually <laughs> take care of the convention center expansion during COVID-19. I wish we would have had that luxury. Um, I don't know that it that it uh, necessarily has leveled the playing field. I, I you know, I think that in, in some respects, maybe we were hurt more so than others, given um, the discussion that we've had and Stacy now going after uh, drive market within the state of Florida, Jonathan going after, uh, you know, the cruise business, but no sales orders are still in effect right now. And clearly we've talked about some of my challenges and Gretchen moving ahead with the mobility program, I think is one of the shiny moments uh, right now, I think is something that we have to do. But, you know, from the airport's perspective, just prior to COVID, the things that were happening at the airport, um, I, I, I use the term, you know, the, the field of dreams, you know, build it and they will come. The, the South Runway was built, it was completed, and everybody came rushing in. And what did we get? We got complaints that we didn't have enough gates and it was too crowded. And it was, and so we, we embarked on this, this endeavor to say, we need to get a bigger and better airport for the future of, of Broward County. Um, and that's where we're, we're headed. And I, and I think we're going to stay on that track. Um, the airlines have obviously, uh, taken one step back to, to breathe and see where they're going to wind up. But one airline executive came to me and said, you know, if you think about Fort Lauderdale um, and Broward County versus some of the other destinations around the country and frankly around the world as a destination market, there, there is a, as they put it, there is an intrinsic value to our area, to our market that they don't find necessarily at, at a lot of other locations. So while we may take that proverbial punch in the gut for a while, 
there seems to be bright optimism that eventually we are going to overcome this and we need to actually be in a position to take advantage of it. So terminal development, we were getting ready to launch into Terminal 5. I'm happy to report that at least the majority of airlines want to continue moving in that direction. The $3.6 billion master plan, I think we're still going to continue to move in that direction. We just might have to re-gear timing a little bit. But if we think about the challenges when we got the runway done and, we, and we, we faced the challenges on the terminal side and we said, man, I wish we would have done this a while ago. Well, the while ago is now. It, now's the time to actually do it. Jonathan made reference of it. Sometimes you need to have not only the political will in the stomach, but the finances to be able to power through uh, economic hard times. In our case, the airlines actually back most of the debt, means they back the projects that go on. So we need to be able to work with our partners to say, there is light at the end of this tunnel. Let's take advantage of this opportunity um, and be ready for when, when all of this recovers a couple of years down the road. And all those woes that we had going through the last three years when we were growing like crazy, hopefully they won't have the same toll on us later because we'll be much, much better positioned. Very good. Thank you. Gretchen, what is your opinion? Even playing field? Well, I think I'm in a different position than my colleagues on the panel as far as um, whether or not an equitable playing field has occurred as a result. But what I can say is back to your previous question with respect to innovation and autonomous vehicles and um, what, what this has allowed us to do is kind of just stop and um, learn from some of our other, the jurisdictions across the world that are um, also, we're all experiencing the same thing. So in that, there's an equitable playing field. This isn't something like a hurricane or a flood that's just affected a small geographic area. Everyone across the globe is dealing with this. And so learning from jurisdictions that were far ahead of us with respect to implementing autonomous vehicle technology or sensor-based technology or smart city technology or whatever you want to call it um, and and watching how the passengers and the ridership uh, are, is fluctuating or what they're doing that's working to be able to help people feel a level of confidence uh, is re really, really helpful. Uh, I think the research that's happening across the world is going to help influence us because we're at the, again, at the very nascent stages. So we'll be able to learn from, from some of the other jurisdictions and uh, I think that will be very helpful to us. Very cool. Jonathan, wow deepening the port, even playing field. I thought that was going to be a game changer. It is. And, and to borrow a little something that, uh, that, that Mark just talked about uh, with, his, with his punch in the gut, uh, the great philosopher Mike Tyson once said, everybody has a game plan until you get punched in the face. Uh, how do you respond? Sometimes you have to step back into your corner, reassess just a little bit, and you come back. Um, but while boxing is oftentimes a team approach, when you look in the corner, there are several people around them. Um, it has a leader. It has those that are taking care, taking care of his health, and also believe those that take care of the the take a look at the at the philosophy of how that fight is going to occur. Uh, we're in a fight right now in ma in many respects. How do we respond? We respond in many ways because of the incredible resources that we have in Broward County. Uh, how do we take advantage of that? We're moving forward on the deepening, on the widening. We're moving forward on our capital and our construction program. We're not stopping that. We need to prepare to change a little bit, become more flexible. We're adding more births. Why are we adding more births? To have more opportunities, be more flexible. Uh, we're bringing in new cranes, the largest low profile gantry cranes ever constructed in the world, arrive in Broward County and at the port in October. That's something to celebrate. We didn't stop. All right, what we did is we reassessed, we took a look at that 20 year plan that you referenced earlier, and we said, what is five years out, 10 years out, that now because of COVID, now because of the slowdown, do we now move to the front of the line? We move that to the front of the line because we have an opportunity to take advantage of a little bit of a change in the economy, while certainly understanding what the financial and fiscal impacts are. 
What we may do is we may push some of the things off a little bit that are non-revenue generating. We bring forward those programs that allow us the opportunity to make additional revenue, make additional money, and feed and fund additional projects that help in our operations. There's a constant change. There's a constant jockeying, ultimately looking so that we're not taking the punch, but what we're doing is we're delivering that uh, into, uh, into the economy. It's a difficult time, but we now have the opportunity with the resources that we're bringing forward, the resources that are here right now, and a plan that consists of all of us uh, and the excitement that ultimately occurs when all of us get together and we say, we have this going, we have that going, that's going to lead to 2024. And the ability for Stacy to sell this area, whether it's to a sporting event, whether it's to a concert, she's making plans three, four, five, six years out. But it's because of the plan that we're putting in place today that allows us the opportunity, allows her the opportunity to utilize mobility, utilize the airport, utilize the seaport to make her job in selling convention and visitors business uh, even better. Stacy, you must be tickled pink. I mean, when you hear this, right, because you're the storyteller of Broward County, you, you, you blast it out to the world. When you hear what's happening at the airport with mobility, when we see what's happening at the port and at the convention center, even playing field? I actually think that we will come out uh, more beneficial than some other destinations as a result of this. I think initially it has leveled us all. Leveled, I guess is the appropriate word for what it's done to us. Um, but we recognize that large, densely populated cities, which have traditionally been major tourist attractions for the world, are gonna be less attractive, at least for the next year, year and a half, maybe longer. And we are not that. We are, as I said before, an open air, spread out, miles and miles of beautiful beaches, uh, Blue Wave beaches, certified Blue Wave beaches. We think that that makes us more attractive than it might have this time last year. So while we don't want any of our colleagues in the industry to suffer, and there has been a lot of suffering in the tourism industry because of this, at the end of the day, we are competitive. We are friendly competitors, but we are still competitive and there are only so many visitors out there. We think we're gonna have an opportunity to attract and reach more of them than we would have had this not occurred. Yeah. Panelists, I just wanna tell you, thank you so much for taking the time today and talking uh, about your different areas. I see an, a light at the end of the tunnel. I really want to thank uh, the Port Everglades Association and Chairman Richard Vogel for, for putting this together and not skipping a year on this. I think the session today was just absolutely informative and we really needed to talk about this to let Broward County and the world know because this is going to go global, this this conversation uh, that Broward County is, is rocking it and uh, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you so much and uh, let's you. make it a great day. Be safe out there and uh, have prosperity. Thank you. We are so grateful to our panelists for sharing their insights and vitally important information with us today. Thank you for an outstanding job. Sincere thanks also to Mayor Dale Holness and County Deputy Administrator Monica Sapiro for their participation. We wish to acknowledge the hard work and contributions of our event committee shown here. This concludes our production of the 12th annual Economic Engine Performance Report.